you probably people have noticed diversity has been a focus. Increasing diversity and inclusion in Fedora has been a focus over the last few years. Um, and I tend to approach that from a um, it feels like the right thing to do approach. I want to have a um, more interesting, more vibrant um, community with a lot of people with different perspectives and different appearances and just different differentness in, in what Fedora is seems right to me, um, which is one approach to it. Um, I happened to see this talk um, that Frederick gave at uh, Lisa, which is my favorite conference that is not Flock, Large uh, <laughs> Installation Systems Administration Conference. And um, I was really impressed with, uh, I, I learned a lot from it and I was impressed with kind of the uh, data-driven approach to it. I also, as you know, from my charts and graphs, like data. And I, I like the kind of the scientific uh, approach to, you know, why this is good for a project. And I thought it would be nice to have that, you know, uh, have this fourth Fedora community to, to listen to and think about. Uh, and I, so uh, we asked Frederick to come um, share with us. So welcome, Thanks, Frederick. I appreciate it. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I'm going to step off the stage here and Same. <laughs> see you later. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Let's see if I can figure this out. <clears throat> so I'm supposed to share my screen, I believe. All right. So can everyone see my screen? I assume so. It's working, awesome, great. All right, and if you want to follow along, there is a, you can actually use that link in your own browser. So I know there are some questions around screenshots, things of that nature. So um, yeah, you can use that if, if, if you feel so inclined. Um, thanks again for you know, taking the time today to listen to me. Again, my name is uh, Frederick Mitchell and what we're gonna be talking about uh, today, this morning, I'm in the central time zone in the United States. Um, how math, science, and Star Trek kind of prove the value of diversity. Um, again, I'm an American. Um, I've been a part of a different open source community uh, called Drupal. Drupal is a content management framework for about 15 years. So it's really awesome when I get to go to other open source communities, kind of learn a little bit about the community, um, you know, be a part of it and, and, and just kind of, you know, engage with, with all the different folks who are passionate about, you know, their space. Um, you know, some other things that, you know, um, are, I guess are tied to who I am as a person. You know, I'm also a heterosexual black man. And what's interesting about, you know, that concept is you know, there are certain things that I may have some privilege on and other things that I don't. And um, one of the things we're going to kind of talk about today is, you know, what does that mean? Um, your reality, your perspective, your the way that you kind of see the world is influenced not only by, you know, your experiences, but how the world kind of, you know, uh, treats you. And a lot of times, especially when people see me, they think that this talk is going to be about you know, race, or they're going to, they're thinking it's going to talk about, um, you know, maybe societal things. And, and what I really want to focus on, I really want to talk about today is this really isn't about, um, you know, kind of going deep into those things. What we're really kind of focusing on today is how can we approach this idea of what diversity is? And if you have an open mind, and if you're trying to really kind of, again, wrap your arms around um, how to place it within the context of your kind of day to day life. Maybe this can kind of give you some ideas. So let's kind of, let's definitely kind of dive in. So again, um, what we're really going to focus on, um, in this, you know, 30, 35 minutes is something called mental models. And if you're not familiar with mental models are, they basically are this idea that, you know, the world is a complex place and what are the ways that we can kind of understand how to um, think about um, the world in general to, t to help us simplify it. It's a concept that's used by a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of developers, and it's probably something you've already, you do all the time, but we're just gonna define a couple. Um, 
I'm not really focused on trying to convince you of something or, you know, tell you that you're a bad person. Again, we just want to kind of focus on positioning. Um, how can we think about some of these concepts and what are we really sort of talking about? So the first mental model that I want to, that I want to kind of throw out there that a lot of these concepts um, revolve around is something called inversion, which is when you're presented with a problem, you're presented with an idea, um, instead of really focusing on, you know, can telling someone that, hey, that idea is wrong, you know, prove me wrong that my perspective is right. Maybe you invert it and say, okay, this is an idea. What am I missing? Um, you know, it's taking a concept and inverting it to, to, to really kind of see, is there a, a, a spot in there that, that you may be missing? So this isn't really about, again, when we talk about diversity and, and things of that nature, this isn't really about, I have a position, tell me why I'm wrong. This is more about, are there things in my current understanding that I could be you know, missing. The second mental model that this talk revolves around is something called the circle of competence. And basically that just means that, you know, is my goal of where I'm trying to go, am I just, do I wanna be validated? Um, do I want my perspective to be right? Do I want to say, aha, see, I, I proved that, that this is, that where I'm coming from is correct. Or is it really about, um, what's a success look like and how do we get there, right? And success can be defined by a lot of things. Um, every time I, you know, kind of bring this up, you know, the, <laughs> there's usually a, 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 an interesting clip that comes back to me and says, well, what if it means that me being right is, you know, my success? And my response is, well, you've kind of proven my point, right? The fact that you would put <laughs> being right ahead of, you know, your definition of success is exactly why the difference between the two is, is really important to understand. Um, almost every decision and every um, quandary that you will, you know, probably encounter in your life will always be about being right versus being successful. And really the goal of some of these ideas that we'll be talking about is really focus on the latter, right? What does success look like and how do we have a successful open source uh, Fedora community? All right, so let's kind of dive into this. So this um, is again kind of um, just a quick little map of where we are in the world, right? So the first is that diversity is a fact. And when I say that, let's just kind of talk about it from a dictionary perspective, right? The definition of diversity, um, it revolves around the idea that uh, things or you know something within a particular context is different. So if we're talking about people, right? This, we live in a diverse world. Um, there are lots of different types of people. I mean, there's, I don't really know how anyone can kind of argue that and you can slice that any way you want, right? Short, tall, um, different physical attributes, different perspectives, different experiences, different realities, et cetera. So the differences amongst, among us are not really in dispute. That is a fact. I think where things kind of get tripped up is maybe the next two points which is what do we do about that? And what, is, what, is, what does success look like? Um, the fact that inclusion should probably be a practice that we do. How do we do things to include more perspectives, include more people to ultimately get to what success look like, which is equity, right? And equity is an interesting kind of concept. Um, sometimes folks, you know, kind of confuse that with treating people, treating people equally and those things aren't necessarily the same. So like a good example is, you know, if I were to give someone who was poor $10,000 and I was to give someone who was really, really wealthy $10,000, I may be treating them equally, but equity was not achieved between the two, right? So treating someone equal is not the same thing as treating someone the same. And you don't necessarily get to the same goal um, if you, you know, don't necessarily parse the, the difference between um, equity being a goal and and just kind of you know doing things treating people equally and and it's a it's a it's a nuance but it's it's a really important kind of difference and the reason why that's that 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 difference is so important is when you look at the kind of graph below we talk about or you hear folks kind of talk about you know why is this important why do I care and the reason is because you know if you're not invested in the goals above. Again, what does success look like? Are we trying to be right versus successful? Then, you know, 
you, ne you might necessarily achieve what you're trying to get on, on, on the right, which is growth. And you stay inside of neutral. Well, unfortunately, the opposite of growth is inertia and the opposite of trying to grow and, and bring more put people inside is segregating them and separating them and saying, well, they're not, they don't belong. And the folks who are able to kind of do that are those with privilege, all different kinds of privilege. And the folks who are not able to do that are not able to be included and ultimately feel oppressed. And so again, just kind of putting the map out there of neutrality is a position. Um, it's a position that anyone can take. And you know, if that's the position that you take that, that's fine. But what we're kind of focusing on today is how do we kind of move from maybe the neutral position to the growth position? And that's what, that's what, that, let's kind of dive deeper into the, some of those ideas. All right, so quickly, let's play a game. So you have a young woman who's three years old when she started to read books. And the game is guess her college GPA. So you have a couple of options, right? You have, you know, she in the middle. Um, this is assuming a 4.0 scale for those um, kind of a traditional GPA, right? Is it, is it high? Is it low? And uh, as you kind of think about this, you know, and you make your guess, I think the most important thing to note is there really isn't a way to win <laughs> this game. And I apologize for tricking you. But basically what I'm trying to kind of put out here is what you just did by connecting you know, a previous understanding of someone's point in life and then trying to project that out to a future prediction is what we call bias. Like that's what bias is. And even though that technically typically has a negative connotation, the point that I'm trying to make is this is how human beings work. Um, we have evolved and we create shortcuts in our mind um, for that very reason to understand or try to you know, connect disparate concepts so that we can make better decisions. And when we over index or take different points that we can familiarize with to make a conclusion, that is technically what bias is. And in a technical community, especially open source community with a lot of different technologists who pride themselves on objective thinking and building technical, you know, uh, outcomes, sometimes we get enamored with the idea that we are not biased, that we are objective, we're not subject to emotion. And the point that I'm trying to make here is, you know, that is impossible. Um, we are all human beings and, and bias, even in its most innocuous form, is just how, how we go about things. So if you're open to that and you, and you kind of take that as, you know, a nugget, um, then we can start to talk about, okay, well, what does that mean? And what's the implication of that? Especially when we talk about the mental model of circle of, of competence, um, focusing on, all right, well, if I have biases, are the actions that I'm doing focusing on being right and confirming those biases, or am I doing things again to, to focus on being successful? All right. Two more definitions that I want to add to this um, piece again, because you know we are technologists and I want to make sure that we have the right terminology because we all know terminology is really important <laughs> in our world. Um, the first is perspective and perspective what that means is, you know, how you kind of look at a problem. Um, common perspectives come from imitation, right? So when you're a part of a group, you know, your perspective is informed by what others in that group have done. So if you live in a different part of the world and you have different, you know, uh, customs, you notice those customs and your perspective is shaped by that. So you just kind of imitate what, you, what you've learned and, that, and that's okay. Um, your perspective also comes from the need to communicate. Um, the fact that you're trying to make connections with another person, right? So it's hard sometimes to connect or communicate with people if you can't come from the same perspective or at least communicate from a similar perspective. And a lot of times when you're surrounded by um, a certain group of people for a long period of time, whether it's where you live, where you work, et cetera, you tend to adopt or absorb those perspectives because again, you wanna communicate, we're, we're, we're social beings, that's how we, we get things done. And the other thing is, you know, we just have this natural desire to conform. Um, you, you try to find your tribe. You've heard it as tribalism, but even in the most innocuous kind of definitions, right, your perspective is shaped by this desire to feel comfortable. And that's okay too. But I think it's just important to note what perspective is. And, and, and the most important thing 
again, is it's, it's how you look at a problem. That's what perspective is. The second thing we want to kind of talk about is heuristic. Um, and heuristic is how you end up searching for a solution, right? So, you know, in the most simplest terms, if you are a farmer and the problem and the perspective that you have has been through the farm and, you know, you, uh, you're familiar with, you know, heavy machinery or planting or raising livestock, et cetera, then if you have a problem such as, you know, hey, I have a leaky faucet or um, I, you know, um, I'm trying to make my, my, my child feel better, um, the way that I would solve that solution or the way that I would solve that problem is likely going to be informed by not only my perspective, but, you know, the context of, of where I came. So how I search for that solution is, is definitely going to influence, you know, ultimately where I come to. Um, why is that important? It's important because when we think about our open source communities, and I apologize, I don't know why it keeps going back that way. <laughs> when you think about our open source communities, right, we have to be cognizant of the fact that different perspectives ultimately come to different conclusions. And so again, focusing on the idea of what success looks like can help us kind of work through the and respect the fact that everyone has kind of a different perspective, a different heuristic when they're approaching different problems. And so come some quick stories in science that, that reinforce this point. Uh, you know, back in the 1930s, there was a farmer who, you know, was trying to figure out why their calf kept getting sick. And it turns out that this particular uh, calf um, on their farm was eating um, a bunch of clovers, um, you know, little, little clover plants. And um, when he went to um, an animal doctor and took, took his calf to an animal doctor, um, what they found was that these clovers have um, a byproduct called uh, coumarin, which essentially thins the blood. And because the calf kept eating the clovers, you know, their, their blood was thinning and they were, you know, had low blood pressure and it ultimately kind of affected the cats, the cats, uh, the calf's um, health. Um, what was interesting about that, man, this thing is really kind of sensitive. What's interesting about that is, um, that innovation, even though it took 40 years, right, was discovered within the context of farming and started with, you know, a calf being sick, but it ultimately ended up being a key ingredient in something called Coumadin, which is a blood thinner, which second to, you know, penicillin has been the, the central drug that has saved the most people in this world, right? And again, what this story sort of illustrates is this idea that, you know, when you approach different problems or when you had different problems with a new perspective and a new heuristic, it can be repurposed and reused to maybe solve existing problems. And the only way to kind of get there is to have different perspectives, which ultimately inform different heuristics. So a problem or a disagreement, or I don't really see that, I don't necessarily agree for one particular person or specific group could be an exponential solution for a different group, which can ultimately kind of help us all, right? And we have these kind of scientific stories, these, these, these facts that kind of exist out there with one of them kind of being the invention of blood thinners. Another example, and there's actually a recent article that just kind of came out that even changed this was, you know, this picture right here. So for the longest time, for those who are old enough, this is how we were taught, you know, um, reproduction happens. You have this idea that, you know, you, you have a single sperm that, um, impregnates an egg and that sperm is the one that won and it, you know, dominated all the other sperm. And so, you know, the, the most, um, the most dominant one wins and that's, that kind of frames some of our, our thinking of, of how we think about, um, you know, what we should prize and what we should value in our society. Well, it turns out, you know, that once we started as a society, allowing women to become <laughs> scientists within this world, the real story actually kind of looks like this, where it's not one sperm, you know, kind of trapezing through and deciding, you know, hey, I'm the I'm the superior one and, you know, I'm the one that made it. The, the actual real picture is more something like this, where you have um, an egg and the egg actually chooses from, you know, um, a plethora of lots of different sperm that end up making it. And again, that just changed how we taught health. And part of that was because 
um, you had different perspectives in the field of science, right, to take a deeper look at something with a different perspective, a different heuristic to literally change our understanding of how reproduction works. And again, it's just one of those things where, you know, I'm reinforcing this idea that, 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 that different perspectives and different heuristic have already proven and already kind of move us forward from our neutral inert, you know, a neutral inertia state to our growth state, how, how we learn, how we, how we, you know, learn new things. All right. So what does that really mean for your team, your community, right? Because I'm sure you already sort of feel like, well, the people we already have, you know, are good enough. Um, my team, our community already has superheroes. We're, do we're doing pretty good. And that may be true, right? Um, you may feel comfortable with the folks that uh, you already engage with. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I think, again, what we're sort of trying to talk about today is given what currently exists in your current um, kind of context, um, what does that mean to uh, include more folks and to make sure that you actually want to run towards making sure, you know, diversity is a big part of uh, your experiences every day. So the first thing we want to kind of do is make sure we understand what diversity is in general, because I think it gets oversimplified. The first thing to kind of know about the definition of diversity is that it's not simple. It actually is very fluid and there are different types of diversity, right? So the one that typically is brought up and is used as almost like a cudgel, depending upon whether you're pro or I don't know if you're against, but just, you know, let's just say argue its priority is demographic diversity, right? These are things that we see. Someone's gender, someone's race, um, someone's sexual orientation. Um, these are identities, right? These are these are identities of origin. They're things that most of the time people can't really control. There's just how they're born. It's something that sticks with them for the rest of their life. Um, and that's, again, that's just one part of what we're talking about. Another is something called experiential diversity, right? And this is based on, um, and this, this kind of comes from what our groups are, what our affinities are, um, what our hobbies are things of that nature. Um, and this is more organic. Um, there isn't really, um, you know, defined by others that you kind of get to define what your experiences are. Um, and, and that's really important. You know, the fact that, that we're all kind of associated and a part of the Fedora community is, is one of those examples of experiential diversity, right? I choosing to be a part of this group. Um, I've organically kind of found this and I want to be involved. And, and that's, that's a great thing too. And the last thing that you probably heard of before is something called cognitive diversity. Um, and unfortunately in this day and time, it's kind of used as a weapon against the first one. Um, anytime we talk about diversity, sometimes people use the idea of cognitive diversity to say, well, that's what's more important than de uh, demographic diversity. And, and cognitive diversity is really about, again, um, how we approach problems. It's really, you're trying to parse people's perspective and heuristic and um, the, the, the point is that you're, you're, you're trying to say, well, as long as people think differently, then that's what's important. I don't want to necessarily focus on how they look, et cetera. Um, and a lot of times what's involved with cognitive diversity is this aspirational concept that, you know, I'm different and I have this different identity. And again, that's okay. I just, the goal of this, this slide is really for you to understand that it's not a singular thing. Diversity is a fluid concept and it's just used as a classification um, to take something very complex and kind of try to simplify it. But the more you understand that the idea of diversity is not a simple concept, that it's a fluid thing and there's all different types, the more you can maybe hopefully be open to um, some of the, the, the scientific facts kind of rooted within, within its premise. The other thing that I wanna kind of stress is Again, one is not better than the other. And it's, and it's, you know, again, if we focus on trying to be successful and what success looks like as a community, we can kind of appreciate all of their different, um, their, their value points as we kind of work through the challenges that we have um, together. All right. The other part that's just kind of out there, but I think kind of gets overlooked when we talk about these things is 
you know, the science of biology, right? And evolution in general, biodiversity, right? We kind of sort of know this, but I don't think we take that concept and, and really kind of bring it into this conversation. So this picture, right, what you're looking at is obviously a frog. And what's interesting about the concept of biodiversity and just evolution in general is it's, it's, it's a scientific norm. We kind of agree and understand, you know, that if different animals don't evolve as things change, you know, those particular types of species will die off, right? It's, it's proven in the concept of, you know, a frog with a sticky tongue and an insect with a slippery body. If a particular species of frog doesn't continue to change and adapt to have a more stickier tongue and, you know, the, the food that it relies on, let's just say it's particular insects do evolve um, a more slippery body then that particular species, you know, will likely not continue to survive. The same is true for the insect as well. So they kind of play off of each other. Um, but we know through evolution, right, that the cross pollinization, the idea that, you know, the sharing of, in this case, just DNA strands create different types of, you know, species and the different factors that are brought in from that perspective ultimately create a different context for both of these species to live and the cycle just kind of keeps continuing. And again, what I'm trying to stress here is this idea that at the end of the day, like momentum is going to keep going and we constantly have to kind of, you know, continuously evolve. Um, and so there's, 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 there's some truth here um, with, with this kind of example. So let's kind of go to Star Trek. And for those who may be a little disappointed, I am going to talk about uh, Star Trek Voyager instead of Deep Space Nine or The Next Generation. Um, but essentially what's, what was interesting about Star Trek Voyager was the fact that um, in this case, it was the first you know, Star Trek that had um, a woman as a captain in, in a major, you know, television series, which sounds kind of weird now in 2020, but at the time it was, you know, very, you know, progressive and, and, and a little bit earth shattering. But the premise of the, the, of this particular um, show was this idea that you had kind of these two factions, um, a rebel faction and Starfleet. And essentially those different people were thrust together in a impossible situation where they were thrown 70,000 light years from the Alpha Quadrant. And they basically had to get through their differences, adopt their differences in order to eventually figure out how to get back home together. So this is this concept that all these different perspectives, people with different points of view who actually were warring against each other now are in a situation where they have to figure out how to be successful. And the first character, you know, that was really important was, you know, Captain Janeway. For those who have seen this picture before, you're probably thinking, isn't that the person from Orange is the New Black? And the answer is yes, this is Kate Mulgrew. But in this particular concept, um, we're really talking about um, a character who was bullheaded, who was very stubborn, who was curious, you know, um, constantly curious. She was a scientist by nature, but she was also a leader. And as a leader, you know, she had her sayings, the fact that she wanted to keep things, you know, you know uniform, but she was fiercely loyal to her fiercely loyal to her crew. And that was really important. Again, as she, she thought about it, given the definition of success, success in this case was getting back home. And we all had to kind of, you know, be there together. And one of the things as a leader that I think is really important when you're trying to figure these things out is the question, you know, are you open to unorthodox thinking, unorthodox um, concepts? And this is where we start to introduce some, some newer things, right? So, this, uh, this difference in this, this uh, comparison between kind of two things, IQ and EQ. So we're, we're, a lot, we're familiar with IQ, um, you know, your intelligence quotient, and, it, and that really focuses on your ability to learn something. Not necessarily what you know, but think about the difference between velocity and acceleration, right? Um, what is the pace at which you learn new things? What's interesting about IQ is that it really doesn't change um, after a certain age, um, it's just kind of one of those fixed things, which is why you have IQ scores. And I think that's one of those things that we as society really kind of over index on. We have this other concept though, called EQ, which is really about, um, emotional intelligence, um, or emotional quotient. And what that is, is that it's your ability to recognize, um, not only someone else's emotions, but also your own. Right. And what's great about EQ is that it's not fixed. It changes over time. It's something you can constantly improve upon. Why is this important? 
because if you understand the difference between the two, then you're able to kind of, again, separate and really un and try to really hone in on, okay, um, when things break down, when we're trying to have conversations, when we're trying to, again, get to whatever success metric we are as a team, as an open source society, um, what are the things that are the most important and what are the things that I can be doing to make sure that we you know, kind of get there? Is it about just having really smart people who can solve problems really quickly or is it about, or, and I didn't say, or, but, and is it about folks who, you know, feel this sense that it's really important for people to feel welcome, that, you know, they recognize what different emotions are, recognize different biases, et cetera. Especially within a group context, it turns out that there's a bunch of studies that basically have proven that the efficacy of a group is actually more dependent upon the group's emotional intelligence of its individual members than it's, you know, the individual IQ of each member. Um, and the teams that actually develop great emotional intelligence boost their overall performance, again, going towards success. Um, and what's interesting about these particular studies is that there are certain concepts that um, reinforce this point. So the fact that the members amongst that community or that team feel like they can trust each other, the fact that they have a sense of group identity, the fact that they feel that they're, you know, um, that they can get things done as a group becomes a really important part of the success of that group. And, you know, as I've learned more about the Fedora community, the fact that, you know, you, you, we have these, um, you know, really rapid release cycles that we're focusing on, you know, um, user experience in terms of, you know, the way the website looks and the mission that's projected out there. Um, you know, I was, looking at some of the sessions yesterday and, and, and listening to, you know, um, the fact that we're making it easier for certain things to be deprecated, for certain packages to be, you know, um, to kind of be let go, how we're changing, how we're, you know, we're doing our authentication mechanisms with Kerberos, like all those different things, right, are, are reinforcing of the fact that the group as a whole is focused on success. And people, when people feel like that they can be a part of that group, that they get, are trusted as a, as a great member, then, those success metrics, those things that we all kind of want to happen are, are increased. And that's really important. And it's really goes to the heart of the fact that um, in order to get there, you actually have to focus on your emotions. You have to be able to focus on the ability to listen, to make people feel like they're included, things of that nature. All right, let's go to our second character, uh, Tuvok. Tuvok was, um, is a Vulcan, and for those who are unfamiliar with kind of the Star Trek ecosystem, um, you know, it was bandied about, I guess, and maybe more of a, a fan fiction kind of thing that that Vulcans were essentially the um, evolution of human beings, you know, far into the future. They could live, you know, three, four hundred years old. Um, they were devoid of a lot of, you know, kind of emotional, you know, kind of trenches. They really focused on logic. Um, they tried to remain calm, but they had a lot of different rituals that they went through to you know really center their society on the um over reliance i guess of, of logic um and their kind of modus operandi was we want to keep peace you know through wisdom experience and vitality um what was interesting about the character within again the context of of what voyager was going through because remember you know, they're, they were thrust 70,000 light years away from their home, um, and they're all trying to figure out different ways to kind of get back there. Um, Tuvok's role was, was very interesting because as a Vulcan, he always appeared calm. He always appeared like he was unflappable in all the different challenges that they have. And he would constantly remind, you know, his teammates that, um, you know, just because something um, looks like it's easy doesn't mean it is. Right, that um, the fact that you know you can see it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be easy to solve. And a lot of times, I think this re manifests itself in this idea that when we have you know disagreements or when we're trying to work through things, we tend to try to you know kind of push back on each other and say, "Well, what is the logical solution? What is the thing that just makes sense to me?" Um, and when you focus on this thing, your perspective and kind of validate your perspective and say, well, this just kind of quote unquote makes sense to me, you tend to kind of get into this area where you break down the effectiveness of the group because the individual um, gratification becomes you know, paramount. 
And there's a, a bunch of studies that have shown, you know, that the most important thing when people feel like that that was a group that they want to be a part of is not necessarily that that individual person was, you know, really, really smart or that they just admire that person, but the fact that they felt hurt. Um, and, and that's, you know, may seem straightforward, but it, it is something that's a little bit hard to do, um, especially when we all, you know, are very bright and we have different perspectives, you know, as, as necessary. And this is where we kind of get into some, again, some more realities out there. So what I'm kind of focusing on here is the fact that, you know, there's been a bunch of social studies um, and the ones that I'm referencing. And again, I apologize to the members of the community who identify as non-binary. What I'm really trying to communicate here is the studies that I've kind of looked at or have focused on, um, you know, the binary, uh, the genders in this case. But, but the overarching idea is this idea that there, had, there have been correlations to uh, the gender identities of the team members and the effectiveness of those teams. Um, I'm not saying there's a direct causation, but there's a high correlation to the number of women within a particular group um, as it relates to the effectiveness of that group. And even though we know that gender is not limited to two choices, I just think it's a really interesting kind of scientific point to, to point out that correlation. Because again, we're trying to get to success. We're trying to to validate and, and, and try to have these conversations with each other to really focus on how should we understand, you know, the different types of diversity, the, the fluidity of how diversity is defined, while also looking at, you know, the rigorous scientific studies that have existed to say, okay, how do we get to this? Because what, what have other successful groups done? And so again, the, the, the key factors here are group satisfaction, group cohesion, and group motivation. Um, and, and, and there's, there's a correlation here that I think is really, really interesting. And I, and I would, I would in, um, encourage everyone to kind of keep exploring, you know, the, the, that part. Um, obviously, this is kind of manifested in different ways. Um, if you haven't seen this comic before, I think that it's a really interesting um, kind of perspective in this argument, right? So this, this idea that even though... Um, I may have a particular perspective and I'm surrounded by people who share that perspective, right? This is, this comic is obviously an exaggeration of, of that reality, right? But it's still an important concept. This idea that in order for us to be more effective as a group, we have to be open-minded to, um, you know, the differences, the different perspectives, you know, and, and the way that diversity is defined. So which can ultimately lead to the question, why is that the case? Why do diverse teams outperform teams that are not? And there's a couple of things that kind of come out of this. The first is when you're in a team with different people, um, just to kind of oversimplify it, right? The members tend to then focus on the facts of what the person is saying because they're not necessarily looking to um, blend their perspective into kind of the group's social majority, right? If I'm in a group where a bunch of people are kind of maybe have similar kind of backgrounds, perspectives, et cetera, then I tend to, I necessarily don't wanna upset the apple cart, right? So, but if we're in a team where different perspectives exist, you tend to want to parse what that person is saying, you're a little bit more careful about what they're saying and you process what they're saying a little bit more, which means that the ideas that have gone through the scrutiny tend to kind of float to the top. And those are the ones that ultimately, you know, can lead to the success of that group, which is really interesting. The other thing that kind of comes out of this is those different perspectives initially, you know, create more innovation, right? You tend to just kind of dodge those pitfalls of conformity. And because again, everyone is different. Everyone has um, a different way of their, how they're looking at it. So there's nothing really to conform to. And typically when you are, I mean, I'm sure you probably have this experience. If you are in a group where you're trying to conform, you're trying to appease or trying not to upset the apple cart, you tend to maybe hold back. Um, you're not able to kind of push through that different innovation. Um, so there are there is evidence of of why why this is the, why this is the case that different diverse teams outperform and 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 again if you kind of think about it you you probably know that you know you can kind of identify with, with some of these you know bullet points, which kind of leads me to my first bold statement right. There's really no such thing as as common sense. Common sense reinforces this idea that there is a quote unquote common perspective that everyone should just kind of know, 
And if you maybe disabuse yourself of that notion, right, you can maybe kind of open up your mind and say, well, if I let go of the idea that's, that, that there is a common perspective and actually everyone has a different perspective and those perspectives are informed by not only their demographics, but also their experiences, um, then I can start asking the question, how do I weave and include those different experiences and the different conclusions to ultimately get to the success of our group and ultimately get to where we're trying to go? What could I be doing um, to facilitate that, that conversation, that innovation? Or even asking the other question, are we, do we have a community that facilitates that? You know, if I look around, again, just demographically, and I, and I don't see people who, again, from the demographic diversity perspective that, that don't look like me, you know, are we actually able to get the most innovative, you know, um, kind of conclusion? Uh, the next character in the series is is, is the the chief security officer, Belana Torres. Uh, what was interesting about you know her character um, within the series was she um, was half human and half Klingon. Um, she was very tough, very brash, um, and she was driven driven by a combination of this innate sense of honor, right, from her kind of her her Klingon culture, but also guilt from the fact that you know she was a human being, um, but also her tenacity and, and what those kind of things kind of bring together. Um, one of the things she kind of talked about was, you know, she wants to constantly feel things, right? She wants to have these experiences that feel things. And I think the, the big lesson that comes out of this is, you know, how do you evaluate, how do you evaluate talent? How do you, uh, to be quite honest, judge others, right? Sometimes we tend to be defensive when someone is coming from a perspective or has an experience that's different than ours, and then they, and, and they project that experience through how they communicate. Um, and a lot of times you may miss the potential of that person because of that defensiveness. Um, one of the books that, that really kind of speak to this is uh, one from uh, Professor Scott Page. What's interesting about him is that he kind of blends the idea of complex systems math as well as political science and economics and I encourage you all to kind of take a look at that. But essentially what he kind of revealed is that progress and innovation uh, may depend less on really, again, like lone brilliant thinkers with enormous IQs. And really it kind of de depends on diverse people having the ability and, 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 the, and the opportunity to capitalize on their specific individuality, right? The fact that they come to a particular situation different than others is there a medium? Is there a space for them to capitalize on that unique perspective to contribute to the to the to the, to the bigger goal? One of the kind of phrases that are thrown out there to really kind of blunt this reality is this 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 phrase of, well, I just want to hire the most qualified person. I just want the most qualified thing. And there's really nothing wrong inherently with that question, but there is something that's being missed. And the part that's being missed that's in that statement is, okay, how do you individually define most qualified? And are you recognizing the perspective and heuristic that you're bringing to answer that specific question? And is that perspective and heuristic limited to right, your own experiences um, and your own you know, kind of piece? Again, what is your perspective and heuristic, right? Which kind of leads to the second bold statement of you have to change your perspective to arrive at a new heuristic, right? And remember, heuristic is how we solve problems. So in order to solve a problem that's entrenched, we actually change our perspective. And the only way to change our perspective is to, right, include different perspectives. And when we do that, we ultimately get to something which we all want, something called right innovation. So what are some examples of when that doesn't happen, right? People have called it or branded innovation, but technically probably wasn't, right? What, what are those fails? What does that look like? And we, we have real world examples of what that is. The first is, you know, the drug Ambien. When Ambien was first in, introduced, when they were doing drug trials, um, instead of actually testing different dosages with, with women, they just assumed that smaller men were good enough, 
and they end up having a recall because that wasn't the case. <laughs> how, how, did they, how do people who are brilliant that come up with different drugs not kind of see that obviousness? And again, right, the perspective probably, you know, was very similar. There wasn't a, a different perspective to say, hey, maybe we probably shouldn't do this. Um, another quote unquote innovation that was out there when Apple first revealed their health kit, when it was first introduced into the world, you know, seven or eight years ago, it was branded as a new revolution in how we track our health. What was interesting about that announcement at the time was that it didn't have period tracking. And so how is it that something that's supposed to be revolutionary innovation somehow excludes half the world's population to something that just, you know, happens naturally and, and is a key part of, you know, um, our biology, how you can be innovative while excluding half the world. I'm, I'm not necessarily sure how that's possible, but again, if you don't have different perspectives, um, to come to different heuristics, you may have what's called false innovation, right? You may be think you may think you have something that's great, but it could be missing something, you know, that, that that's very, very large. Um, the same is true for the institutions that we laud, right? Uh, what's interesting about, you know, Harvard's admission practices is that as much as, you know, it, it's been lauded as this great, you know, place, and I'm not saying it's not, as it was investigated and, and went deeper into how they actually admit their students, it turns out that, you know, 40% of the folks admitted to Harvard were just come from people who had went to Harvard before. So it wasn't necessarily that the, the most brilliant people are the ones who get in, you know, the innovative process, the innovation that's typically associated with a top tier university actually may not necessarily be as innovative as it could be because their current practices are, we just want the same perspectives kind of over and over again based on how we you know, um, admit people into this particular institution. And my last one, which I've always just kind of found shocking, and I'm sure um, those in the audience who identify as women kind of know what I'm talking about, is I've never really understood, and I didn't know the fact that, you know, the fashion industry has really focused, you know, for, for the longest time on the visual appeal of their clothes versus the function of, you know, just kind of living simpler and easier lives. And so there's this whole kind of thing within women's fashion that there are a bunch of clothes are just not made with pockets. And as a heterosexual man, it just kind of mystifies me because I don't understand how, you know, in all the innovations that exist within our world, how we can kind of continue down this thread of, you know, um, kind of denying the most kind of basic, you know, essential kind of tool that is associated with our clothing. Um, but for whatever reason, it just, it, just, it, it just has not been a part of, you know, what's kind of going on. So I know I'm running out of time and kind of, kind of go through these, these last little points. Um, the last kind of character we'll, we'll kind of talk about is Seven of Nine. Seven of Nine was a character that um, was both Borg and human. She was an assimilated human. Borg is, um, is a really interesting kind of concept in of itself, can probably be its own talk. But essentially the Borg was this race that essentially assimilated every particular species, thought that they could be a superior species by taking the best parts in their minds, the best part of a species, assimilating that into their giant kind of hive mind, and then discarding the rest. What was interesting about Seven of Nine's character is that she constantly, you know, kind of dismissed all the different human aspects of her team because she thought they were irrelevant. And the allegory here is that that's sometimes similar to what we do with each other, right? When we're in a technical community and we want to talk about, you know, different ideas, different concepts, we tend to want to dismiss those things as not being relevant, maybe political or whatever that is. And um, I think there's a kind of a broader concept here that we need to be open to, which is, you know, what is it exactly that make someone care because if I if you introduce this concept into you know this this realm that I necessarily want to be in um, you know this technical realm and I don't necessarily agree with that then um, people who are like me won't care about this anymore so therefore we should introduce these concepts because I don't think this is important so the first question we need to ask ourselves is what does make someone care and it really just kind of comes down to you know four simple concepts vanity right how does it make me look virtue how does it make the world better? And those two things are you know, very powerful, but there's really kind of two things that I really wanna focus on. And I think it's really important for, for, for our community to focus on to really understand 
that drive people in a particular direction, especially when we talk about trying to get to successful, inclusive community. And that's fear and profit, right? When we talk about the challenges that we have as a Fedora community, bringing in younger contributors, um, improving the user experience, um, making our documentation uh, more easily searchable, usable, so that people can onboard faster, right? We want to make sure that we focus and we focus our energies to these last two things, right? How do we unpack what people are afraid of, these differences? And what would it mean if we are successful? I mean, imagine a world, right? What would it mean if a door is more widely used and it's a lot more context? Does that mean more jobs? Does that mean more prosperity? Does that mean more innovative um, you know, uh, features? Does that mean a more open world? Right? How do we get there? How do we profit from that particular idea? So now we need to go into the math of, of, what, of, of how we get there. Um, and the last thing I'm going to introduce um, as, as I kind of wrap up is this idea of the diversity trumps ability theorem. And this particular theorem is derived from a specific paper, um, but it does require certain conditions. The first is that the problem must be, be hard. Right. Um, each solver who's trying to solve this problem must have their own kind of local optima to that problem, i.e., you know, some sort of expertise within that, bringing them together. Um, an improvement must always be able to exist. Right. So we're not talking about solving something that has a definite solution and that's it. We're talking about a constantly improving thing. And then we also need to make sure we have a large pool of solvers to, cap to, to have this kind of decent sized collection. Right. So if those conditions are met, then the theorem holds essentially that diversity will always trump the individual ability of the members when trying to solve that problem. It could actually be represented via mathematical equation. And essentially what you're looking at is you have this idea that, okay, given a whole bunch of people and they're each making their own prediction of what should happen, right? This is when you're in those group conversations. Well, I think we should do this. I think we should do that. Right. And then you kind of average the predictions of everyone, right? The crowd prediction in general. The theorem essentially holds that the error of the crowd equals the average error of people in the crowd minus the diversity of those predictions. So think about that for a second. Basically, in order to have a more accurate prediction or an accurate outcome, right? We're talking from a math perspective, it's the ability minus the differences in the categories that we create, which means that if we don't create more perspectives, right, the difference is bigger. And so the ultimate accuracy is smaller because the collective ability of that group is detracted from the fact of, okay, how do we take all these different perspectives and ultimately come to a most accurate prediction on the other side. So the only way to get that collective accuracy is to have a disparate number of choices, a disparate number of ideas that ultimately affect, right, the crowd's decision. Whereas if they're all coming from the same perspective, right, the ability to have a more accurate crowd prediction is decreased. What's interesting about this theorem is that, again, this is proven. <laughs> this is a mathematically proven perspective, right? This isn't a feeling. Diversity is not a feeling. This is a, a fact. It's like the Pythagorean theorem, right? Um, and you can definitely take a look at this and look at all the mathematical simulations that kind of prove this out. With any kind of theorem, there's a counter, right? Theorem, which is great because in any type of discussion, you want to be able to have, you know, um, a countering perspective. And even in that perspective, there's a counter to that too. So I encourage everyone to kind of look at that and look at it from, again, a, 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 a curious scientific mind of, you know, these, these particular concepts. So what this model tells us, right, and the purpose of these formal models is that we want to think of people as more of like a collection of tools. Um, yes, we can subject them for kind of empirical testing, but we can also use them to change how we think about the world, right? So if we include different perspectives, we can use that as a way to kind of sharpen our ways to think about the world in a different way. Um, 
the individual's ability is a reflection of the applicability of those tools, right? Given that set of problems. So again, when we talk about improving UX, when we talk about in, in, you know making documentation better, getting younger contributors into our ecosystem, right? There's this idea that the more people we include is actually more of like, is our tool set robust enough so that we can tap into those different abilities to apply those tools to initially solve the problems that we have, right? And this is again, reflected in that mathematical paper. It's actually called um, the Hong Page Perspective Heuristic Model, again, which forces us to think about people as a collection of tools and their individual ability as a reflection of the applicability of those tools. Which leads me to my last bold statement, right? The pipeline problem of talent in a lot of places is not necessarily that their talent doesn't exist. It's usually because there's not an incentive to go and discover that talent. Um, problem solvers with diverse perspectives, you know, tend to have a hard time communicating with each other. And so there's this kind of weird kind of feedback mechanism where the reason why we don't include other people is because it's hard to communicate with people who are different than us. So how do you solve that problem? How do you solve this kind of chicken and egg thing? And the answer is, right, emotional intelligence. This is kind of a representation of that. All three of these things do the same thing. But when you're looking at them, you may see them as, you know, different ways of solving the same problem. And essentially what you're looking at is a carabiner. The first is created by a human. The second is actually created by AI, and it's 75% lighter than the first one. And the third is actually an AI generated carabiner, but it's actually 3D printed. So even though they all solve the same problem, right? Initially, you look at them and you may say, okay, they're so different, I don't actually know what they do, even though they technically are kind of going in the same direction, they all fulfill their definitions of success. So again, what is that tool? What is that thing that will help us be more cognizant of different perspectives so that we can include as many people as possible to ultimately get to that success? And again, that thing that, we're, that we need individually is something called EQ, right? Because if we focus on improving our emotional intelligence, right, then we can ultimately recognize what are the things that we're doing to neuter our own collective success as a group? And how do I make sure people feel that they are a, a big part of this group that we're trying to do so that we can solve these bigger problems? So my genuine hypothesis that I wanna leave you with is open source will make the world better by requiring equity, right, the goal, and using emotional intelligence as an integral part of its interoperability. And I just you know, wanna make sure that I've connected all these ideas together because at the end of the day, yes, we're all technologists, but us recognizing that there are things inside of us to ultimately make people feel included, and, and we recognize that diversity is a very fluid concept. If we recognize the things that are kind of blocking us from getting there, feeling vindicated, you know, feeling threatened, those emotions that trigger those, those, those things, if we're intelligent about that, we can ultimately kind of get to that success, right? So how do we grow? We focus on our mental models, right? We go from prove me wrong stances to what am I missing? And we, again, ultimately ask ourselves, okay, when I'm contributing or when I'm being a part of this group, am I focused on being right? Or am I focused on, you know, being successful? So in conclusion, the way we can solve difficult problems is we want to make sure that we look at people as a set of tools and the diversity is essentially the distinction of those particular tools. And the way we can only use those particular tools is that we have to efficiently collaborate. And the only way to do that is to continuously develop our emotional intelligence. There are some additional stories that I would love for you all to kind of take a look at, to kind of look at what that manifestation looks like especially from a gendered identity perspective, um, especially when we talk about including more women into our open source groups. Um, but at the end of the day, thank you for listening. And I really, I really appreciate it.